what point in the in the scoring process do you get involved with the director? Is it, is it like do you have like an early meeting, or do you you know do dailies, or what do you? Right, it, it depends. I'm I'm on a project now that they've been sending me the dailies, and yeah. so I've, I'm definitely getting a sense of what visually they're going for and what tone they're you know they're shooting this this movie in. But um, on this particular project, on the Book of Boba Fett, the the music discussion didn't really start until the spotting session. We, we, we sat down and watched the first two episodes. They, they had a rough cut of it. They had some old, uh, old you know, music, Tim Den, and, you know, it, it just kind of started the discussion of the flavor of the score that we were going to go for. They, they used some old Mandalorian music, I think, in, in the first initial cut of it, you know, and since this show sort of relates to the Mandalorian. Uh, yeah, I love Mandalorian. Yeah. Wow. It, 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 uh, that's great. Yeah, it, 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 this show relates to it in certain ways. It actually intertwines itself with it as well um, at certain, in certain ways. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we had, a, you know, it, it was an organic way to get into the show, starting with something that we had already done two seasons worth of, you know, of music for. So, but, yeah, I would say it was a little bit later in the process that we got involved. It, oftentimes you'll get started with coming up with themes and ideas and suites and, right. and even before you see a cut of the, a picture or the daily or whatever, you know. So it, it, it kind of depends on the project. We already had, like, a natu natural conversation going with this particular show that it... It was okay to just kind of come in later, you know, and just yeah, see the first yeah. spotting session. So you so. have like a pre pre meeting or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there was already this uh, sort of natural like collaboration, and, and you know, John and, and Ludwig. So John Favreau and Ludwig have worked together for you know quite a long time, and right. my involvement with Ludwig, you know, helped that along in that sort of way, you know, creatively. It's yeah. like. I know, I know what Ludwig did for Mandalorian, so it kind of helps. It helps us here for the Book of Boba Fett to get into it the right way, you know. So yeah. When do you, when do you dovetail sound design with music? When do, how do you do that? When do you, and do you do that? Often? Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, oftentimes, like th there is, uh, there's an example in this show where they needed a sound effect to. Uh, to alert the viewer that we're going into a different timeline in, in the story. So they, they they needed something musically to happen, but then on top of that, the sound effects department laid in, you know, an additional sound effect to just really sell it, you know. So it, some, sometimes uh, the score has those types of effects and, and things like that within it. There, there is one cue actually in this show is in episode four of the Book of Boba Fett where Boba is in his ship, which has its own personal, you know, its own sort of gumbo of sounds. And it, his ship gets caught by a Sarlacc pit. You know, it's the Sarlacc pit from Return of the Jedi. And the sound department sent us their sound effects for his ship and for the Sarlacc because they, they're very like unique sounds that they were going to use for that scene. And John Favreau was like, you know, it'd be cool if the sound effects and the music could work together in a musical way. So that they sent us all the, that material and I, I just threaded it throughout the queue. And, you know, when the Sarlacc was grabbing the ship or when Boba's shooting from his ship, like, I used some of those sounds in musical ways to, like, map it onto the grid of the of the scene and onto the, the cue itself. Um, but a, a lot of times you just, you write the music and then you there's a little space that a sound effect can work on top of it. You know, a lot of times, oftentimes you, you don't really mess with the sound effects. It's a, you know, it's like a different it's a whole different, yeah. It's, it's a whole different person. Different world, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very talented people, though, over there at Lucasfilm that do it, for sure. What about synthetics? Do you get involved in that? For How sure. How do you dovetail that with, with the score? The, I love doing that. I, I love taking uh, non-organic sounds and mixing them with organic sounds, you know, and, and trying to find ways to that they can complement each other well, you know. And I, I think it adds a lot of... Uh, personality to the score when you can find things that maybe on the surface you wouldn't think would work together so well but then when you stick them together they actually they create more of an impact you know uh, in a lot of the, the music for this show yeah there's a there's a ton of synths and there's there's a bunch of uh, you know more production style elements that maybe you, you know like an 808 bass sound or um, you know, hi hats that you would find in like a hip hop, you know, song. What's an 808 sound? An 808, an 808, an 808 is it? Well, it was originally it was it was a Roland synthesizer that had that made drum machines. Oh, okay. And it was called the Roland 808. But like the the bass from that drum machine 
became just this iconic thing that we still hear today on the radio, on pop songs, hip hop songs, you know, everywhere. And it's fun trying to phase that into a film score, you know, and have those have those sounds sort of live on in that sort of way. And it, it, it adds a certain edge and it, it makes things feel contemporary in certain ways, but it, it adds a lot of depth and, and, and drive sometimes, you know. So it, it, yeah, it's fun to like try to blend different genres a little bit. Is that hard to do? I mean, is it? Lot of, sometimes a lot of key, key, key songs. yeah no sometimes well you know you can either sample the sound yourself by recording the actual instrument be it a synthesizer or you know whatever an acoustic guitar you, you could sample those and then map it onto your keyboard and play those sounds back via MIDI or you could just perform that stuff live and that, that's always really fun too you know if you have a sketch for a, a cue in a, a certain sequence if you've got your synthesizer and you can perform that stuff live and it's always really fun as a composer to feel like you're back in a band i feel like you know all of us here probably started playing music when we were young with our friends or families and, and I, I definitely did you know playing live is a really fun aspect of music and, and that's what that was our entry point into it you know so sometimes performing live even if you're just by yourself scoring a cue in your studio room it it, uh, it livens things up for you as a musician and as a composer, you know, and it's a little more fun to do it that way. So, yeah. How about the cinematography? You've got this sweeping thing, of, you know, this landscape behind Boba. Does right. that affect your score? 100%, you know, it's uh, the landscape, the environment, the, the planet he's on, you know, for this show, they wanted each planet to have a different sort of sound a different personality about the different planets yeah. yeah how do you decide you know right gloomy versus hot versus right cool. well in, in a lot of this series in particular takes place on tatooine which is a planet that pops up all the time in star wars and you know it's a very classic star wars planet and it's like very arid really sandy dust, dusty it's just it's a desert just you know completely dry landscape and uh that that definitely informs you know the texture of some of the score you know um, there are certain sounds that musically just sort of at least for me when I was working on it, it felt like it fit with a desert landscape a little more gritty there's a little bit you know just sort of just dry texture to it that uh that seemed to work well and then you know uh when the characters go to different planets that have a little bit more like of a high tech or uh you know a little bit more it almost seemed like a video game some of these environments they found themselves in that in they're just really really uh neat high-tech sort of environments that uh you know some of those moments in that in those episodes would get a little bit more tech based or you know synthy and, and less organic you know darker yeah you know yeah, dark, it, it, yeah. yeah it, it's all um, it's like you, going in a cave or something you yeah want to start and you want to yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. exactly how about uh, when do you decide to go silent like nothing how is that decision made how do you that, do that so the decision to go to not have music is almost as important it's definitely as important as to have music you know right. you know it's like miles davis always said it's not about the notes you play it's about the space in between the notes that you right. play and it's so true with film scoring and with you know essentially th those decisions are made during a spotting session and um and that you know it, a silent moment in the show or, or movie could be just as impactful as one that has extremely emotional music happening and to accompany it so but it usually that decision is discussed you know or that that question is raised during a spotting session and you'll you'll discuss that with the directors and the uh, the producers and everybody comes to an agreement on what what they think it should be then you take that information and you go and maybe you'll try something out you know or, or go silent where they thought there was going to be music so it all depends on how it, how you react to the story you going know. silent can be very effective yeah really effective. very effective it's old hitchcock movies like there's nothing going on right you know well and you know it's like we've gotten so accustomed to just music wall to wall yeah that uh, and that's just kind of a style it's a stylistic thing now but uh, it, it totally can work without music sometimes. You know, th there are moments where you add more of an impact when you have that contrast, you know, to go silent and then bring in music. Yeah, bring in music, yeah. There, there was one cue where someone gets shot in the show, and uh, I decided to go, you know, it, it, this is this discussion with everybody, but we, we were thinking that it would be more impactful to, like, have the gunshot and the death 
be completely devoid of music. And then once everybody realizes what happens, that's when the music swells in. And it, it really works, you know, it was almost like an old Western um, trope. You know, you don't, you don't play the gunshot, but you play the emotion of everyone feeling it and seeing it for the first time. It, re it added a lot, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I've been doing music uh, for most of my life. I, I wrote my first symphony when I was 12 years old. Uh, I played 20 instruments and I did not know that I would actually be doing television and film. Uh, I, it wasn't a thing that was in my mind at the time, but my brother, uh, Ralph Farquhar, uh, was a, it became a writer and he wrote for a show called Happy Days. Oh yeah, I remember And he yeah, used to say to me all the time, and then he said, Kurt, you write so much different music, you would be perfect for television. And I like, I don't even watch television, so I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, young enough and inexperienced enough that he doesn't know any better. They don't know the or, rules yet. Yeah. Or, or to get somebody long enough in the style that he doesn't give a crap. So, <laughs> when to break them. so I'm, I'm one and not the other. <laughs> Okay, how do you uh, how do you decide to go silent? Like, let's not have anything going on. That's a that's a big deal. I'm a uh, uh, I'm a amazing advocate of that. I mean, I have argued many times of saying, you know, we've done the score, we've done this piece, and <clears throat> and we'd get to the to the mix part of the of the uh, uh, film. And I said, you know, it's just been wall-to-wall -wall music, one thing yeah, after another after yeah. another. And I said, like, okay, stop. <laughs> just now, it just seems like it would be more powerful to strip all the sound out. Let's not have the crickets, let's not have the wind, just just suck, slowly suck all of the sound out. And that's just going to make everybody lean in and really <clears throat> focus on what's going on, take the music out, you know? And then it it makes it more powerful the next moment that you do hear exactly, the music. Yeah. Remember so, the movie, The Birds? Remember The Birds? Oh yeah, absolutely. Wow, I mean, <laughs> that blew me away. <laughs> really powerful, yeah, right? Yeah, you no know? music at all. It's yeah, that is, that's such a powerful approach yeah, to it. Yeah. I'm not advocating for a lot of a lot, a lot of the birds type of movies. <laughs> Baby needs new shoes, so I'm gonna need to have a little music in there. <laughs> when do you when when and how do you dovetail uh, uh, sound effects? How does I mean do you do that often? Uh, well, this is guys? this is a uh, process that's sort of extended over a period of time, like in that sound spotting area, the, the, the sound designers are in that spotting session too, along with music. And especially, it's especially important in a, in a television show or picture that, that is superhero oriented, action oriented. Or, or sci-fi-ish, you know. Yeah, a lot of so, shooting and a lot of car chases, that kind yeah, of stuff. So yeah, so you sometimes wonder then, what, which would give me the desired effect? What's going to make me more tense? Silence and just hearing the wind rustling something and just sitting in silence and yeah, that rustling wind. Effective, yeah. Is that more effective than my low tension strings or whatever? new sound design that I have. What what how do you wanna go after it? Do you wanna do you wanna go after it? Do you wanna make a, a a scene very brutal by just turning up the every hit and every you know the, the blood falling and splatting yeah. on the floor. Is that more is that more gruesome and 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 dark and and painful ones? and listen to then my music telling you to feel that. Yeah. So some it's not a right or wrong. It's this could work this could work better this time than that could work better the next time. And what you want to do is have a conversation. I've written entire scenes, you know, with score where once I've heard what they did with sound effects, I said, can we start dipping the music out a little bit and go more into the sound effects here? And in the mix 
point of it is when we start making that balance of, of which are we going to go mostly with. And a lot of times, that that in most cases, that decision is made by the director or the producer, and stylistically how they see it, how they feel that it should go. And, do actors ever have any influence on, like, if there's a love scene and it's real close and you score one thing and they go, no, I'm not quite comfortable with that, let's do something different. Do you ever run into that? Well, that's that's something that you would go at before it generally comes to the composer. That's something that they would go at with the director. Uh, but I, I work with the actors in that I have a thing I call dancing with dialogue. And, you know, it's not them just saying what they ever, ever they want to, however they want to. They, they, the great actors have a rhythm to them. They have a pulse to how they do it. Now, I can either dance my own dance and step on their feet the whole time and, and therefore step in on their dialogue. Or I can time it with them and get in pace with them, you know. And, and if I'm doing that right, Act, direct actors have come back to me and said it, it was seamless I didn't even I was halfway through the scene before I even noticed that you were in there I said it's, I said yes because I'm not fighting you I'm dancing with you I'm going with you you're the lead I'm the accompaniment and we're going together but we're going in the direction that you're leading me and there we go I'm Ginger Rogers in this in this dance <laughs> How long does it take you to? I mean, what's the what's the timeline? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? I mean, what is it? It's it's different. <clears throat> I've been That's working on an animation uh, piece we started in in 2019, uh, and it's the series uh, I just finished wrapping all of the music for that series. Uh, uh, oh, jeez, what am I saying? I'm not finished. I won't I won't finish until June. Really? On that? Yeah. So some things really drag out there. Yeah, well, it's animation, and it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of the process of, of animation, which a lot of the, the actual animating happens overseas, and then comes back here, and there's all the back and forth with actually achieving uh, uh, what they need to see picture-wise. That's, uh, that's a long, long, arduous process. Yeah. yeah. You, ever do, uh, you ever do trailers? Is that challenging? I have, I have never done a trailer. I I did a, a few commercials earlier in my career, but uh, never done a trailer. Somebody said trailers are very difficult because it's boom, 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 boom. It's a lot to have to happen in a very quick period, which is kind of like kind of like sitcoms. <laughs> you know, you have a short short piece of music that has to go through all these different things very quickly. So. How do you decide uh, original score versus like needle drop? How do you? Well, uh, you decide that in conjunction with it. this is what spotting sessions those choices are made with uh, the uh, uh, the music supervisor the, who chooses music, the, the executive producer or in a television show or the director in a film, uh, and the. That's the that's the whole question of which is it that we really want to do? Uh, how do we want to lead? And then I, one of the shows, First Kill, that I was just working with, <clears throat> it's a very complex dance of, of, of score to song going in and out and one handing off to the other. And if you're doing it right, you, sometimes you don't know where the where the uh, the score ended and the song began. You know, there's things that a lot of people are going to think that it's it's a song already starting, but it's no, it's still just me. It's not. And and then all of a sudden you hear a voice come in and it's oh, I'm in a song now. <laughs> and, and and sometimes they have so, uh, songs that have interesting intros that they use to cross into the uh, uh, into the uh, uh, the score uh, into the scenes, you know, to make it more interesting. When, they, when there's like action and explosions, do you guys work closely with sound design? Yeah, sometimes. Actually, there was a whole sequence uh, at the end of The King's Man um, where there's a sword fight um, between uh, Rave's character and, and the big bad guy. And Matthew loved the music, but then when everything was in, 
with the kind of very high piercing swishing of the swords, he, he wasn't getting enough of either the swords or the music. So uh, we had to work very closely with the sound guys to kind of figure out which frequencies we were going to take up and how it was all going to work together. And that's not uncommon at all. I mean, I will request very dense uh, action sequences, um, the sound effects, I'll request them so I can't, I know what I'm up against and I know yeah. what's going to cut through. Do you work with, like when you do sweeping outdoor scenes, do you work with a cinematographer and say, well, this calls for some of this kind of sound? Not so much. Not too much, um, okay. not so much but uh, again on Kingsman, you know, having read the script and, and, and talking extensively with Matthew Vaughan, you know, he was very... Uh, very descriptive about what he was shooting and what kind of music he wanted. So not with the cinematographer per se, but uh, with the director and, you know, he was, he, he, I want you to imagine a huge landscape, very Lawrence of Arabia or whatever he said. And, you know, that immediately puts a musical idea or whatever it is in your head. So, yeah. Do you ever go against type? In other words, something that normally would be like, big music but then you say no let's keep it way down you know what more recently I've been doing that um, and not not necessarily because I've been asked to do it by a director but just I, my process now I want to come at things from a different angle um, I feel like we're in a place where so much has already been done. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's in it, <laughs> whether it's action sequences, whether it's emotional sequences, um, I, or just generally with scores, I just want to try and come at things from a different angle because you know we're in 2022 and from Bach to Schoenberg to whoever to you know Tupac, we've kind of covered everything. <laughs> so. Um, I do like to try and mix it up, and sometimes it's a risk, uh, and sometimes it, it works gangbusters, and everyone's like, oh, I, you thought of this, works, and yeah. yeah, so it's trial trial and error with that kind of stuff. What about deciding when to go silent? That's a very good question, and my MO is normally as much as possible, uh, because so many movies and TV now are just wallpapered with music, yeah. and so it just it doesn't mean anything after a certain amount of time if it's always in. Um, so actually, it's funny you say that spotting for me is more about not spotting where music is, it's where spotting music isn't. It's not, yeah. 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 Um, where are the gaps? Where can we breathe? When do we not need it? When does the performances and the cinematography and the sound effects, when when do they take the forefront? And then when do, when can we accompany that? So, um, great question. And it's, it's, I feel like it's underrated how important the silence is um, as a film composer, because it's, it's really important. What comes to mind is Alfred Hitchcock and the birds, remember? Yeah. No music. No music. Scared the hell out of you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and oftentimes in comedy and horror, that's the yeah. way to go. Yeah. Um, you know, there's jump scares and things that you can accentuate and, you know, whether it's slapstick comedy, you can accentuate that. But for me, my, my go-to is leaving those things alone. How long does it take you typically to score a film? What, what weeks, days? What? Well, uh, the Kingsman was the better part of two years. Not oh. quite, not quite two years, but what with the pandemic, I was off by a mile. <laughs> no, but that's not normal. That is not normal. The, the normal amount is like two to three months. Really, um, two to three months. Okay. But. As I said, these last two movies I've been on before they've shot a scene, so, um, and there are pros and cons to both of them. Um, and then with TV, it's, I've done shows in five days and I've done them in two weeks, three weeks. Um, so it really varies on post-production post schedules, COVID, <laughs> uh, you know, release dates, you know. It, with Peter Rabbit, we, um, there was, it didn't happen, but when the movie came out, there was some controversy with one of the scenes and we were going to have to go back in and really? rescore it with a different thing. Yeah. It didn't happen. I was going to ask it was that. Kind yeah, of, have to go back. It was crazy, oh, but it, at one point I was on the phone going, really? <laughs> um, you know, the digital age, we, there's no limit to what you can change now. There's, you can always go back in and do something. Wow. 
What about bringing emotion? I mean, do you use emotion? How do you use emotion? How do you bring emotion into a scene? How do you decide? Um, I think it's a conversation to, as a starting point. I think it's a reaction to what you're looking at and also what's not on screen for me is important. What, what's the true meaning of the sequence? What's the true feelings of the characters? Because oftentimes they'll be saying one thing and they mean another thing. And it's important for uh, the composer to portray the emotion of their story arcs and the overall story arc and not necessarily what you're seeing immediately on screen. Um, and there are some directors that want you to go whole hog and there's some that want you to pull it back. Um, you know, I'm... I, I edge towards the cheesy nature, and I want you know I want people to cry. I want to manipulate them. <laughs> um, but I've been I've done th things that you know the director doesn't want that. You're being too obvious. You need to pull it back. We need to leave more of a, a, a ambiguous feeling in this scene. So. Um, yeah, it, it, again, it differs. I like to lay it on thick. <laughs> I like the cheese, but uh, sometimes I have to pull it back. <laughs> have you uh, have you done trailers? What is that like? I, you know what, I've never done a trailer that's come out. We were asked to do a trailer for the King's Man, um, teasing the main theme because it's a new theme for the prequel, and it got f however far down the line and. Um, it never came out. They uh, Disney decided to do their own trailer. So somewhere in the world there exists. That's really difficult. That's hard. It's tough, and you, it's all yeah. very rhythmic, yeah. and it's all um, it's it's a, almost a different skill. I don't even know if I'd be able to do it regularly. Um, I think it's very demanding. It it's really very fun. demanding, and also I feel like we're at a point where maybe the trailers are sort of becoming too similar and someone needs to take it and mix the genre up, do yeah. something different with yeah. it. Because it's all like, ching, ching, sh -ch 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 action, ding, ding. <laughs> so, you know, the trailers that I gravitate towards are the ones that don't do that and the ones that kind of mix it up. So, yeah, the trailers that I know are The Voice of God, remember him? Yes. Yeah, The Voice of God. They don't do him anymore, he's gone. No, it, well, yeah. Larry Fontaine, I think it was, yeah. he died. Yes. Um, and he was he was on everything. He you know, was great. The inner world guy. Inner world. Inner world. Inner world. Inner world. Yeah. <laughs> he was fabulous. But they don't do that anymore. Yeah. No, you're right. There's no more inner world. One man, you know, there's none of that anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sequencing, when you when you when you climb up on a musical score, then you cut it off and you go back. How does that work? I mean, do you plan that ahead of time, or I mean, the, you mean the peaks and troughs yeah, of what the, the score is yeah, doing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, we we have sporting sessions in which we go over this stuff extensively, and oftentimes there'll be a temp music track that the editor's thrown music in there from other films that evoke what they're, they're going for musically. Um, so you have an inkling of, of what they're feeling. And sometimes, you know, you'll score a sequence in isolation and then when you see it in a run, you're like, that doesn't work. I need to do that differently. I need to yeah. navigate that sequence differently because we've had all this music and because I did this in isolation, there's more music and it's so tiring. I gotta actually come out here. Um, so that's a really fun process for me is, is fi it's like a puzzle, figuring out where I'm gonna be high, where I'm gonna be low and where I'm gonna culminate, where am I gonna climax? And it's, it's, it's a very fun process. Synthetics, you use that a lot. I do, yeah, I do, but I do like to keep it a little bit more elect uh, organic as opposed to electronic. But there's, you know, so I, there's a lot of percussion. I actually uh, recorded a lot of live percussion earlier on before the show started, and I did uh, brought in a bunch of Chinese instruments and Chinese uh, percussion instruments, uh, big drums, and just kind of, you know, made a lot of patterns and grooves from there. So there is that, like that sort of organic sound and sort of that live sound, and then I work with live musicians, string players, as well as an air player. And I mean, there are synths, but I that was my whole kind of approach was to do something that was not electronic, but something that was organic and um, earthy almost, I guess. And, and yeah. Do you ever go against type? In other words, something normally calls for very loud sound, but then you say, "Oh, well, let's bring it down." Do you ever do that? I I try and do that because sometimes 
if anything, just for, for, for me, because it's like, oh, is, there, is there any way to play this scene? Is there any other way to play this scene? You know, is there any other way to to just, just do it differently so that I'm not always doing the same thing over and over? So the audience is, you know, and, and sometimes I think doing that, I like doing that because it, it makes people lean in or like, oh, that yeah, was expected. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, think, I mean, sometimes it's, it's good to do that um, if, if the story just really calls for it, you know? It's, I mean, some, sometimes I think they're, the scenes that they shoot are kind of like that as well, where it's like they, they're they sort of playing it in a way that's like, wow, it should be really, should be really more amped up here, but actually I, the actors are doing it. I don't need to do that. The music doesn't need to say that, the same yeah, thing. It doesn't, yeah, no. Yeah. Now, do you ever go silent? How do you decide that? It's hard to do that on certain shows, on certain yeah. projects, um, because sometimes it's just the style to have a lot of music in there. But I like to go minimal when I can, or silent when I can, because sometimes it just doesn't need it. It doesn't need the music, you know? Um, it's not always asked for, though. <laughs> Some people like a lot of music. People like a lot of music. People yeah. like a lot of music. Um, but I think I mean, it depends. In certain films that I've done, it's other, even other shows that I've done, they're just like, no, no, no. We're done. We, we need we need a break. We know that the listener needs a break. We know that the viewer needs a break. And you know, and other times it's like, no, we just we want we want it all in there. So I try to. <laughs> how do you uh, how do you pick the peaks and valleys? How do you decide? Okay, let's bring it up. Let's bring it down. I mean, it's usually in, for me. It's usually how what the story is doing. You know, if if. There's, I mean, in the case of Kung Fu and some other shows, I, I know that they have to, um, you know, like you have, you have a scene out, like a scene is going out, and so you know that there's sort of a way that they're going to play that scene. You start out like this, and then it kind of has a peak, and it kind of, I mean, you, you just watch it. I watch it. I always watch everything with no music first, no temp music. I, I listen and watch first to, to just the silence and just to kind of see how it's going, and then um, and kind of just let let the acting decide that. But sometimes it's fun to just really play around with it. Sometimes it's not it's not, it's not what you think, or or it needs sometimes it needs pace. Sometimes it needs pace, and so like oh okay, I feel like we really need. You know, I mean, I'm 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 an audience member just as much as those who are viewing the finished product. So I feel like I go with my gut instinct to be like this scene feels a little slow without the pacing. Of of music you know and then other times it's like yeah we don't we don't need anything here or like wow we really should, we should really ramp up here because this is a really important part of the conversation that I missed you know I missed the I missed that that happened um, sometimes I'll choose peaks and valleys also based on in, in an episode it's like oh we have to set up that story that's gonna happen later and I, I, I get to the end of an episode and I realize wait why are we doing that thing oh because there was a scene earlier on where they talked about that thing and I'm like I missed it. I better, I better make sure that music, you know, alerts us to that more. You know, so I'll make choices that way. I mean, it's it's really, it really is. There's the creative aspect, but there's also the craft of it. It's yeah, like it has yeah. to be. You have to. I have to make decisions based on what I think is either I shouldn't say missing, but what I think needs extra support um, or needs me to stay out of the way. You know. Now, do you look at scenes and think, okay, this is a this is a recurring theme, and then you go two or three scenes later, and then you do that same recurring yeah. theme music? Yeah, it's it's good for continuity. I mean, I'll yeah. change it up according to shape it according to the scene, yeah. but absolutely, it's it's uh, it's like oh, okay, this is the storyline continued. So I take the music from that and I continue it. But then, but likewise, then I'm careful not to take that music and use it for a different storyline because yeah, that wouldn't work. Yeah. yeah. So it's like so. Um, but yeah, it's good to do it for for continuity. It's good to do it for um, you know just to, to help a viewer get get back into that moment um, and frankly it's good for speed you know these have to be done fast so there's you know there's reasons to do it that way as well um, but it but it makes sense you know it doesn't when do you decide to go big with music when do you when do you decide well a big action scene a fight yeah, scene yeah, something yeah. Like that. big action scenes yeah. I don't I don't like to do big music on big dialogue scenes but big when there's no dialogue that's when I I try to go big well I should well, say well, no, like no. a death scene or something maybe big sound maybe yeah. maybe I, I've done I've done it both ways and and that's actually when they'll say like sometimes like a really smaller intimate scene or just you know an emotional scene sometimes I'll go like much quieter and much because like something that just draws me in and it's right, like oh right. I feel it like just that one single line no, or that one yeah. thing and then other times when I do that 
they ask for something like, actually, we really want it like a bigger swell, we want like a more orchestral sound, we want more strings. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's a preference thing, you know? Yeah. So sometimes I decide one way and they decide another way. <laughs> but that's okay. It, you know, it still works. You know, and it's a collaborative effort. It still so. works, yeah. It's very really collaborative. Yeah. yeah, no, for sure. Now, do you use, uh, do you use original a lot or do you use needle drop sometimes or how does it, what's the, the what's the it's for me for me it's all it's all original for me it's all, all original. original if they okay. if they want to use songs and needle drops then that's there's another department that deals with that okay um but sometimes um i'm asked to you know in the case of like last season there was something that it wasn't the needle drop but it was a song that an actress was singing like on not on screen but on like a tape recorder or something and it was part of like a musical clue of some kind and so i was sort of responsible for writing that song and you know um on gremlins it's actually really interesting it hasn't come out yet but there there have been times where i've, I've had to write songs that are playing on a radio or a record player or something something like that and so it's essentially a needle drop that I wrote <laughs> so on Kung Fu no there's a separate sort of department that's they, they get that but it's um, on other shows it's different but, but in, in, in any case I'm always it's always original so if it's coming from me it's original I'm not finding I'm not finding an existing piece of music um, I'm either writing it or a tour of the music then yeah. What's that? You're the auteur of the music. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But yeah, finding other existing stuff, I don't. I, that's, I don't do that. <laughs> if you're hiring me, you're getting original. <laughs> you're getting the original song. Yeah. Um, the uh, how long does it take you to to score music uh, for like a, a TV series? For for an episode, yeah, episode, I have about a week. I have about a week. A week. Oh. Yeah. So if it's thirty minutes, if it's forty minutes of music. It's a week, yeah, yeah. So from, from start to finish, so by the time I receive it and look at it and, and watch it and decide and my course of action to writing it, to getting it approved yeah. and any notes are back and forth and then to recording it and then mixing it and then delivering it is all a week, so. What about um, trailers? Have you done I, trailers? I haven't done trailers, I haven't done trailers. So, oh, a lot yeah. of people ask. Only one guy said he did a trailer. He didn't like it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know. I know. It's so chopped up. Yeah, I don't know how you, I don't, how do you. How do you do that? Well, okay. I I've done something that's been more of like a sizzle reel. It's like okay, it's like a like for kung fu. I actually did it. Was like oh, it was a sizzle reel. It was just it, it was essentially a trailer, but it was a, it was a longer trailer. It's a promo, right? It was so a promo, of, yeah. and so that was scored. But that was and it was tricky because for that exact that reason because you have to keep energy up. Yeah, like, all the time. It was like scoring yeah. it, but it was different than scoring it. It yeah. was different than if it was the real scene. You wouldn't, you wouldn't work that hard. Yeah. You every, know? every second, you've got to chop it up something different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's, it's. Uh, there, look, there's people that are really composers that are really good at it. Let them do it. Well, I heard, I heard that there's people that just do trailers only. Only yeah. that. But oftentimes they're writing the music. My understanding, I could be wrong about this. Maybe I shouldn't speak to it. But I, my understanding was that they're writing music. Period. They're just writing music. Like it has a feel and a style and then there is someone else who puts that music and cuts it into the trailer so and that's why it's so jumpy because it's just different pieces of music yeah. but i think it's also done in other ways too so i probably shouldn't speak to that i don't do that. but there are people who are really good at it let them do it <laughs> um how did you get started in this business? I, mean, I was one of those kids who figured out that I wanted to do it. So I actually saw the I saw a movie called Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves when I was 12 or 13 and heard the most amazing music I'd ever heard of in my life, a score by Michael Kamen. And I just was like, I'm so moved by picture and music that I just want, I just want to do it. I just want to do that. And then, you know, I just, it, so well, getting it, so, get in? so I, yeah, so I went to school for composition and theory. I did an undergrad in that. And then I actually went to graduate school for it. And then when I came out, I was, I was working first as an assistant to, um, Walter Murphy, who does the music for Family Guy and American Dad, so I was kind of getting my way into TV already, and then okay, there's, yeah. and then I started doing additional writing for a composer named Blake Neely, who does a lot of um, television, a lot of episodic for Greg Berlanti, and so I sort of started working with him, and that was kind of, I, I would say that that's probably where my career turned, but even before that, I was doing you know my own projects of 
know, student films, festival films, commercials, did a little bit of trailer stuff, which I wasn't very good at, you know, and so, and so, so it was kind of like started out by cutting, cutting my teeth on those projects and then, you know, getting just more and more of my own and then working with Blake Neely and then getting more from there. So I feel like, you know, it was just, it was kind of working what I call like in my league and then working out of my league, you know, where it's like I'm learning from people who are further along in their careers, very, very talented people, and then, so, until now. So it is, you have it's, projects it's, that you're involved in now, like independent projects? You, like an independent film or something? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a, I'm working on a film now. It's based on a book called uh, Happiness for Beginners. It's a, it's a, it's a film of the same name. It's a book by Catherine Center, and I'm working with a filmmaker I've worked with before. So it's, I love working with people that I've worked with before. It's a good relationship. You get a shorthand. So, but yeah, that one's a, a Netflix film. That I'm working on now, so it's film, and then I'm working on an uh, animated series called *Gremlins: Secrets of the Mogwai*, which is meant to be a prequel to the movies, the Gremlins movies. Um, that's for HBO Max and Amazon. When is that coming out? That was, I think that was coming out later this year, like maybe October. Okay. Cinemax and, and, and Netflix. Uh, uh, HBO Max and Netflix. Yeah. yeah so